Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Nevin Gusak, the host of the Patriotic Populist. And with me once again is geopolitical analyst and author J.R. Nyquist. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, the changes in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe uh, during the late, 1990, late 1980s and into the early 1990s. And we're going to be talking about how, taking it up to the present day, that Russia, the Russian Federation, continues many of the old uh, Soviet features, that really the Cold War has not ended, that it's just uh, Russia, it's worldview and ideology, it's just old wine and new bottles. So welcome to the program again, Jeff. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Nevin. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So we hear constantly in the news uh that Russia is this geopolitical threat. Of course, you have others that say, no, it's not really communist. It's not really the old Soviet Union. It's just a Christian nationalist uh, republic form of government or dictatorship. And, you know, the research that you and I have done shows very clearly that Russia retained many of the Soviet features, even under our supposed friend Yeltsin. They continued their massive espionage, backing for client states throughout the world. Uh, they continue to promote subversion within the United States, the NATO camp. They have this partnership with openly communist China, and they continue to have war plans directed against the United States, according to the testimony of military defectors and intelligence defectors from the Russian Federation. So tell me, how did you come to believe, what series of events convinced you in the news that something was very amiss in the Soviet Union. You know, I remember the Gorbachev years, and, you know, there was this view that Gorbachev was a new kind of communist, that he wasn't committed to global domination, and Ronald Reagan even believed that Gorbachev wasn't interested in taking over the world or expanding the power of the Soviet Union. But, of course, the evidence at the time and the evidence that has been released in documentation uh, that have been leaked out from uh, by various uh, individuals like Vladimir Bukovsky and Pavel Strylov, as well as defectors, shows that Gorbachev, just uh, to quote uh, former Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gronikko, was a, uh, what was the expression? He's a nice man with, a, he has a nice smile, but has iron teeth. So we're going to start off on that. And because people were thinking, oh, he's going to be this new young breed of communists. And Gronovico was like, eh, 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 eh. and we know that he was a protege of Yuri Andropov, who not exactly was this warm, fuzzy character. He was the chairman of the KGV and the uh, general secretary of the Communist Party of Soviet Union um, after Brezhnev uh, passed away in 1982. So, Jeff, tell us how you came to the conclusion that nothing that it was uh, that Gorbachev's policies were a deception. Well, you're forgetting, Nevin, that um, uh, that Andropov liked uh, jazz and was a closet liberal, right? Oh, yeah, I missed that. Oh, I, uh, I missed that was that. a story that they kind please. of put out, yeah, in the 80s. Um, Deception. Well, is uh, I think I'd mentioned on a previous uh, on our first uh, episode that I had uh, read through the defector literature, and the defector literature had basically uh, talked about a a fake collapse of the Warsaw Pact alliance that uh, Jan Shana had written about in his uh, starting on page 100 of his book We Will Bury You. There's a section on the strategy uh, of the bloc. And then uh, Galitzin's work where he went into great detail on his new methodology that, you know, phony splits and uh, a super deception in which they were uh, sort of collapsing communism. And he describes this uh, false liberalization and whether or not this false liberalization would be accepted as genuine or not in his book. 1984 book, by the way. This is even before Gorbachev comes to power that Galitzin's predicting this. And I had become convinced through that and other hints and other defectors said that this was going to happen. I became convinced that indeed it was the plan. Uh, and I, I, it was April of 1987 that I, I had my epiphany and I thought, 
they are going to do this. But the question was, of course, if I thought this, uh, as I saw things unfolding, how would I tell if it you know, was true? Of course, what I was looking for was, was evidence that what I had come to see in the defector literature was not true. You look for counter evidence. Mm -hmm. You look for something to show you that the changes are genuine, that it's not a deception. So, and there's a hard question there. Uh, given the superficiality of the press, uh, what that would be, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what would you look for to see if you, you are expecting them a fake collapse and they're doing a, a, it seems like it's slowly giving way, Soviet communism. And okay, how do you know whether this is the real deal or something else? Very difficult question because, um, you know, you're you're kind of, trying to say to yourself, what would it look like? So when I was watching events, you know, a lot of the things that Gorbachev were doing uh, seemed reformist, seemed quite amazing, you know, loosening up the economy, for example, allowing uh, entrepreneurs to exist, allowing other political parties. I think the uh, Liberal Democratic Party um, um, of Vladimir um, Zhirinovsky was formed when Gorbachev was still in, in charge of the uh, country. So it's like, okay, well, but then you see things like Zhirinovsky was a former KGB officer, mm -hmm. you know, and you think, so the guy that's allowed to form a political party, a so-called liberal democratic one was a career KGB guy who got kicked out of mm -hmm. Turkey, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of doesn't, you're looking at this, okay, this doesn't falsify the thesis. This rather supports the thesis that it's not mm -hmm. legitimate. Right. Uh, and then you look and you see when they start offering deals to foreign uh, companies to come in, it's this 4951 thing that they had during the NEP under Lenin in the 20s. Mm -hmm. So you're going, all right, they're copying Lenin in the 20s. So you, I'm looking for something that's authentic, that's genuine, that's new, that's not like the original you know, problem. And I'm not finding it. So I'm thinking, uh-oh, it does, you know, uh, this is sort of, in a way, it's confirmation, and I'm not finding anything that's, uh, that's not happening. But, uh, of course, I know that the superficiality of the reporting is going to mean that I have to probably wait years before I get things from books, from people on the ground, from defectors, to see if they're accepting this mm -hmm. as genuine. And um, I, I suppose uh, there are big moments in Eastern Europe, obviously, uh, watching this Ceausescu's death, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, this is, a, this, this is a communist dictator, he gets killed, okay. This looks like it's real. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, maybe something real is happening. But then the news trickles out that the generals that overthrew him were a long time agents of the GRU of the of the Russian special services mm -hmm. so it's like okay these guys and then and they were the the, the politician who comes up to replace him uh, was a classmate of Gorbachev in the Soviet Union that's right, right. Ion Ilyescu. yeah right exactly and then so you look at this and you go oh oh Ick, you know, a genuine revolution would not produce the leader of Romania, who was a classmate of Gorbachev, of all people. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you had the August coup in 1991. And, and uh, well, there was also, I, I can't help missing uh, the, um, the uh, German Democratic Republic's dictator, was they they couldn't put everybody on trial, so they put him on trial, um, and um, Eric Honecker, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Honecker. So Honecker's on trial now. I followed the newspapers. I read the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times every day, and mm -hmm. that's that's much better than watching the news because they would have in depth articles, and mm -hmm. and occasionally they would have articles, by the way, about some of these revolutions. They're stealing the revolution from us with old faces. You know, you would see this in Romania. You'd see this in, in like uh, Hungary or one of these other countries. Mm -hmm. So still no indications that it's really genuine uh, that you're getting. So then I followed the Eric Honecker trial through those years. And you know how that trial ended? 
you know, he was never convicted, you know. No, no, but I know he even revealed, along with defectors from the German Democratic Republic during its so-called reformist years, as well as documentation from the Soviet Union in East Germany, which showed that it was all stage managed by the Soviets. Right. Well, I, there was, here's an that's what caught That's what caught my eye about even what Honecker admitted, because right. I he admitted that. There was a little piece in the paper in the back pages, I think it was the New York Times, Mm-hmm. And it was about that the prosecution wanted to withdraw the case mm-hmm. because they were not sure that the guy that they had on trial was actually Eric Honecker. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, wow. it was one that everybody missed. And I, <clears throat> because I was really carefully watching at that time. And of course, mm-hmm. I didn't, I wasn't a library scientist. So I didn't know how to dig through things and find some of the gems <laughs> that you found. I was just doing it the human way you know it's the way i knew and of course there weren't computer i didn't have access to computers i i well i did i had a macintosh back in those days but it was you know it was just a word processor a fancy word processor so anyway um um so so it was like they dismissed the case because they weren't sure that was the real guy that they had on trial so they had a a, a double and um, so then you get to the August coup to fast forward. And so far, I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking, you know, I, you know, I could be wrong. I mean, what do I know? But this doesn't I'm not seeing anything definite yet. And then mm. the August coup happens. And I'm thinking I w- I'm watching Ted Koppel, right, because Ted Koppel was in Moscow. Mm-hmm. And if you and these are like an outtake. And while the August coup and you're waiting to see something authentic from Russia and it's uh, Ted Koppel standing there in the street in Moscow with his microphone saying that he was going to interview people in the street. He was going to get the real story, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and so there's – they don't – he comes back on and he says, well, you know, this is a different country and people are going to say some pretty strange things. And I thought to myself, what strange things did they say that he didn't put on any interviews, man in the street interviews with Russians mm-hmm. during the August group? Were they saying they didn't weren't buying it? Is that why he didn't put it on there? Mm. And I thought, I thought, okay, this still this is a con- counter indicator again. And you know, I was trying to believe in it. I was trying to find something that would get me to believe in it. And a friend calls me up, mm-hmm. who had dis, you know, had, had questioned what I was saying all along. Didn't go along with it. Didn't believe that the changes were fake. And he calls me up. He says, I give up. It's, it's, this is so fake. He couldn't believe it. He did not find it believable. And here he was not, you know, mm. not really believing what I had been saying, that there was this strategy and everything. And he, he followed this August coup thing and he said, I don't believe it. It's fake. Mm. Uh, it's fake. And, of course, the whole story that Gorbachev was held prisoner that, you know, all of these things happened, that the general may have committed suicide, very suspicious, that these new political parties were genuine, uh, led by genuinely independent persons. I mean, it, and in the emergence of Boris Yeltsin, a candidate member of the Politburo is the new guy. Mm-hmm. This is a new guy. This is a revolution. This would be like uh, one of the King of England's closest friends becoming the, the you know, the head of the Continental Army. You know, and then and it's just the, this revolution doesn't make sense. So, yeah. yeah. What's interesting, just a side point before you continue onwards, I remember the August 1991 coup myself. And and I just re- remembered it was very strange because I said to myself and by then I was, uh, you know, inter- interested in Soviet history and whatnot. This was I was in high school. And I said to myself, this is a country that has tele- literally masterminded coups in other countries with perfection, Czechoslovakia, Afghanistan. They've funded and supported revolutionaries and taught uh, various intelligence and military services like the Cubans to mastermind coups in Nicaragua, for example, in 1979, in Grenada, same year. And all of a sudden, they're dropping the ball. And this is the situation where 
You know, they have, the Soviets have put down many a bloody uprising and strikes and whatnot since almost its founding. It just seemed unreal. And then Yeltsin standing on the tank in front of cameras, it just seemed like it was so staged and geared to the American psyche that we would just eat this up, the average American, because we like theatrics, we like heroics. It doesn't take a psychologist in the KGB to figure that out. Um, so the bottom line is, as I that started my, I would say my suspicions towards what was really going on in the Soviet Union. But I accepted it, nevertheless. And there's a long story how I gradually grew to be very suspicious of events in Russia and then Eastern. Yeah. So go you ahead. You got a KGB coup where the people are lo- allowed to order pizza out and their power isn't cut off and they're access to internet the the rest of the world they they could have cut off their fax machines their phones they didn't cut off anything exactly this was televised this was meant to be projected to the rest of the world and the rest of the world is buying it and so it's like at that point you know i was wanting to believe it was true and my it took my friend you know who was who was actually uh, you know, already ready to believe it, who was not believing it. And so it's like when you go down it, and then, of course, Yevgenia Albats, a couple of years later, mm-hmm. comes out with a book, um, The State Within a State, mm-hmm. the KGB and its, you know, continued control of uh, Russia. And she basically says that the August coup was engineered by the special services. It wasn't an attempt to overthrow the state. It was fake and she <clears throat> she says we we we've, we've got a it's a, actually under Yeltsin we they tighten things up mm-hmm. from Gorbachev's time mm-hmm. uh which is a fascinating thing for her to have said um and of course this is a woman i think her father was a GRU general if i'm not mistaken so this is a woman who was in a position she was on the commission to uh reform the KGB and she quit because she said this is a joke there's nothing here is being reformed. Mm-hmm. So, and of course, um, then you 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 go forward and you see all the things, the Potemkin village things that they gave. Uh, I uh, my dad had a friend who was a, a major evangelical guy who uh, was supporting a major mission into the collapsed Soviet Union, and he had his book translated into Russian. Mm-hmm. And uh, my dad said, you know, what do you think of this? And this fellow, I uh, think, well, people will know his name is Josh McDowell, and he was went into Moscow, and they had set up this bookstore with this giant pile of his books in, in translated into Russian in, a, in the center of the bookstore. And, of course, I recognized, as he described it, the all the earmarks of a Potemkin village. As soon mm-hmm. as he was gone, those books were gone. Mm-hmm. You know, this was all set up for him. Uh, if if you know anything about uh, uh, Russia, this kind of Protestantism isn't appealing. He was taken to the Central Committee building where Central Committee members gave their Christian testimonies. Now, this mm. was just too, this is just ridiculous. Mm. You know, the Central Committee, members of the Central Committee of the Communist Party Soviet Union are going to say how they were secret Christians all along. And now well, they're, they're, probably, their they're, they're probably laughing all the way to the uh, Soviet State Bank, the Gauze Bank, uh, after that whole charade. Even if, even if they, and, and it could have been they were paid actors, they weren't Central Committee members at all. How would he know one from, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, here's the keys to the building, bring that American in there and do this act for us. Um, it, it was too incredible, because if you, if you knew these people, if you knew their milieu, this is inconceivable. Um, it really is inconceivable. So I didn't see. And then, of course, if a country swept out in a coup, other people are, you know, pulling the flag down. Other people are, you know, cha- you know, they're pulling the hammer and sickle. No, it's 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 Gorbachev and Yeltsin and and their friends. They're pulling the flag down from the Kremlin, you know. And it's like um, it, they're doing it themselves. They're actually doing it themselves. So. It's like, wait a minute, they're taking the flag down, they're changing the Soviet Union, they're making it into a different system, and it's their people that are doing it. Yeah. So, so got a qu- couple of follow-up questions regarding that. Um, any of the Yeltsin and Putin-era defectors, um, 
not warned about this, but blew the whistle and said, look, the 1991 coup was fake. I seem to remember that Colonel Stanislav Lunev gave some indications of that, as well as uh, Viktor Kalashnikov, who was a former KGB. And, oh, and yeah, yeah. Victor SPR Kalashnikov. officer. He gave quite a bit of details about that. Could you uh, tell the audience about what the well, defectors have said? It's it's years later, years, years and years later, Viktor Kalashnikov was a KGB officer who worked in Vienna. His expertise was German, German language in Germany uh, during that time. And, uh, you know, he he explained to me from the point of view of someone from the inside what he thought they were doing and what he was told. And this was sort of the ultimate confirmation of Galitzin because it filled in things for me that uh, that helped me to understand what what okay they have a plan but then there's what really happens and how they because every time you have a plan you know no plan uh, survives meeting the enemy right mm -hmm. so they had to improvise at times and and of course what happened here um, uh, what happened here in this in this situation said he said that. They had this plan, and what, how they were in the this part of the KGB, they were told, look, we're going to, we're going to reunite Germany, mm -hmm. but we're going to reunite it in a way that the forces that we control, are going to end up in control of this new Germany. Which, by the way, not to interrupt, that's something very significant that Glitzen brought up in New Lies for Old and the Perestroika deception that it would be a neutralized socialist reunified Germany. Go ahead. Right. And the idea was that Germany, of course, just like Galitzin, uh, Germany would drop out of uh, NATO and it would then make its own security treaty with the Soviet Union or whatever state would be there. And um, he said, so it was all uh, it was all meant to to happen. And for example, um, uh, with the Berlin Wall falling, they were actually, and this is in Bukowski, they were planning to collapse the wall the next day. The problem that happened is that mob that took down the Berlin Wall, it came a day early. Mm -hmm. uh, they they did it. So they were going to actually use passwords, pa passports, sorry, internal passports, and, and they were going to do that kind of thing between East and West Germany. But mm -hmm. that got nixed. So that was a little bit of a hiccup for them. And there's all these small hiccups. You know, when you're doing something like this, you're giving people freedom. You're letting them think the system's falling down. So you're going to have things happen. Well, yeah. there was actually talk of resealing the Berlin Wall after it was let down and the Soviets nixed that. If you remember, Egon Krenz, who was the new uh, chairman of the uh, SED, the Socialist Unity Party, which was the ruling Communist Party in East Germany, and General Heinz Kessler of the National Volksarmee, the National East German Army, uh, they had plans to actually seal the wall. There was actually talk of even a Chinese solution too, the, mimicking Tiananmen Square, because China and East Germany over the years grew very, very close as the mm -hmm. so-called split was being openly healed. So there was that talk. And of course, Honecker was viewed as a liability. You see, the Gorbachev plan for Eastern Europe, you know, to summarize, really could be found in the documents of, I think it was Central Committee or Politburo of the Communist Party Soviet Union. It's available on the Cold War International History Project affiliated to the Woodrow Wilson Center of Princeton University. It's the Bogolomov Commission. And the Bogolomov Commission, which was convened in early 1989, was to preserve Soviet, uh, socialism in the Eastern Bloc, uh, but it was very risky. They wanted to somewhat take the Soviets out of this uh, extreme, out of, out of dominating Eastern Europe. They would guide the process in Eastern Europe. They would kind of keep the West out, but it wouldn't be the same Stalinist, Brezhnev type of socialism in Eastern Europe. It would be socialism with a smiley face. But my impression, of course, would be certain basic authoritarian features would be retained um, because they ultimately wanted to save and revivify and revive the system. That was really the purpose of it. And I think a lot of conservatives, uh, Paul Kangor, for example, if you've ever read his books, he's a great scholar in many ways, but 
he really gets sucked into this notion that Gorbachev really wasn't totalitarian. And, you know, I don't know if you've read his stuff. Uh, a little bit, yes. Yeah, he's very much a Reaganite, and God bless him, but he's really kind of into that mantra. So we have scholars on the right like that who are good anti-communists to a degree. You know, they have their narrative, which is very influential. And then on the left, by and large, the American left, you know, they're going to think people like you and I are absolute kooks, paranoids, and conspiracy sure, theorists. Sure, right. You know, so really... Truly, you're, we have a yeoman's test, and that's why I like to dig into the evidence and really exhibit it. You know, when you take a look at what happened in Poland and Hungary, there were negotiations between the ruling communist parties and um, and the Soviet Union. Gorbachev himself met with the general secretaries and the presidents in both countries, and they literally were using political maneuvering to preserve communist rule. They would give, cede certain political positions to the uh, to non-communist uh, element political parties and political personalities, but the communists, the ruling communists, the Hungarian Socialist Workers Party and the Polish in, uh, United Workers Party would retain control of key positions. And that's what happened for a little bit. Uh, in Czechoslovakia, you had at first, very similar to the GDR, East Germany, you had Gorbachev try to put in his protege, his last name was Mlinar, a uh, very close ally and colleague of Gorbachev, but he refused to take the position as the head of a new Czech uh, communist government. So then it was ceded to a group of people like Ladislav Demich and others. And eventually, and again, what happened was also in Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, East Germany and whatnot, the communists then also had a plan. And this is documented in my books, for example, where they did a false privatization where the communists all of a sudden became multimillionaires, the heads of corporations, they established a variety of businesses. I mean, that is it pertains to today, because even Cliff King, in the latest show of America's Survival with you and Cliff Kincaid, you have uh, former East German communist leaders, uh, economic planners and Stasi officers there. Uh, the heads of various uh, Russian firms in United Germany, like Gazprom. You had Alexander Schalk Golakowski. He was um, a very resourceful businessman and high level Stasi officer. And after the collapse of the wall and after the reunification of Germany, he basically did deals with China. He was a fixer for deals with communist China. He applied his old trade of raising hard currency. Um, <clears throat> which he did a very effective job, raised billions upon billions of Deutschmarks through a variety of schemes and capers, as well as legitimate commerce that garnered the East German, uh, the East German communists uh, a lot of money. So yeah. this well, applies uh, to today because they're still underground. What, what you're saying about the communists taking over the economic system through privatization that process was not able to occur in East Germany the way it happened in the other countries. Um, and Kalashnikov described this to me. He said, in, in the unification of Germany was supposed to take several years. And they, didn't, they did not want interference from Western bankers. That if Western uh, bankers, like West German bankers, if they, uh, if they uh, came up, they could pour enough money into, once it was possible to pour that money into West, uh, East Germany, they could overpower their economic actors there. And they could, you know, basically wrest uh, key economic holdings in East Germany away, particularly if some of their players sold out to the West Germans. Mm -hmm. Um and mm -hmm. so uh, what happened is he said everything depended on the West German bankers being under the influence of the Russians. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a uh, – at this time, and I guess you can go back and I can't remember the name of the banker, but there was a banker who was gunned down. Uh, oh, yes. West German banker. Yes, right? I know. You know who I'm talking about? Yes. Red and Army of course, mm -hmm. What's that? The Red Army faction killed him, and the Red Army faction received prior support from the East Germans. 
Instead. Well, the thing is, is that the Russians didn't don't they don't believe that the Red Army faction killed him. Mm. Oh, really? Do tell. They uh, they don't know who killed him. They suspect, mm. and they have their own reasons. They suspect that it was British intelligence killed him. Mm. But they don't know for sure. Is what he told me. We didn't know how this could happen because this guy was extremely important to them. Mm. The fact that he got killed. Now, maybe there was a, a, a screw up and maybe some crazed um, East German communist went off on his own and, own and did it. But they they didn't. This messed up their whole plan. Whoever killed him, whether it was a communist who just went off on his own or was whether it was the British like they suspected <clears throat> or whoever it was that assassinated. Because what happened is this. The bankers, they lost their control over the West German banks in how they would handle the policy because that they because, you know, the implication is this guy was their agent or their agents were around him and controlling what he what he did. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what happened is, is that they lost control economically of the process and they lost control of the speed of the process because the bankers were dictating the pace. They were saying, oh, we don't have the money. We can't do this. It's going to take us years. We got to go slower. But once the banks were willing, like, let's do it now. Let's spend, you know, huge amounts of capital to integrate East Germany with West Germany. And that's when you lose control, when their agents and their economic forces in East Germany lost control. Mm -hmm. And he said that's when and he said this created a cascading effect. And this is what went wrong with their plan. He said this was supposed to take several years. You've got the these East German uh, – in East Germany, you have this massive uh, collection of German armored and mechanized divisions, which was uh, together with the GDR army was the East Bloc thrusting force uh, in a future war, right, against NATO, between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. And uh, that army suddenly – that Soviet, those Soviet armies, I should say plural, that Soviet army group was sitting on the territory of a NATO country where if a Soviet soldier stepped outside the base, he wasn't simply stepping outside the base into East Germany. He was stepping outside the base under the, under the soil of a NATO country. Correct. And what started to happen was some of their, their brainy guys, some of the technical guys logistics, uh, t technical support people who the, these armies relied on started stepping off the base and defecting. Mm -hmm. That's right. And they started losing, and this was not part of their plan. This was not what they had intended. They started losing, and basically the commander, I forget his name, of, those, of that uh, group of forces, mm -hmm. he basically signaled to Moscow, we need to start the war now. Because this army is, in a matter of weeks, is going to lose its ability, its fighting ability, because these are critical people. We can't replace them, and they are defecting. Mm -hmm. We're losing them. Mm -hmm. And the response that, uh, you know what Moscow's response was? What? They took away his tank drivers. Because <laughs> 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 they didn't want him to go off and do anything on his own. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. <laughs> they took away his tank drivers, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so he tried to find, I guess he had some Central Asians he tried to find and train to be tank drivers. But so so this process, so basically the the Soviet army in East Germany being on the soil of a NATO country, people felt like they could get away with things. And so the whole army started step by step coming unraveled. Mm -hmm. Because when you give people the option of freedom, when they think the totalitarian system is going – they start to spontaneously sell it out in their own ways. Exactly. Yeah. And he said then what was happening within the Soviet army, and, and Kalashnikov wasn't too specific, but he said that the Ukrainians, the West, particularly West Ukrainian spirit uh, within the Soviet army, as you know, the Soviet army was integrated. It was all the 15 republics, all of the ethnic mm -hmm. groups. They would be in the, the units together. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like these are Russian, you know, although in Afghanistan they deployed units that were largely Russian and Ukrainian because then they didn't trust certain, you know, their Central Asian friends unless they were handpicked. Um, and they would put them into special units. But they, they, uh, they found that the Ukrainians were organizing 
to get control of parts of the Soviet army to start a revolution. Mm. And uh, they had always, he said, in the latter Soviet Union, they had told, you know, the Ukrainian KGB had a bad reputation because they tortured people and they did these awful things. And they said, you can't do that anymore. You know, we're trying to create a new Soviet Union, right? We're trying to create this new face mm -hmm. and uh, you're wrecking it for us. And they say, you don't understand. These Ukrainian people are really anti-Soviet. Mm -hmm. And we have to use, we can't be the, you know, the iron fist and the velvet glove. We just have to be the iron fist. And so because they had tried to tone it down so much, they were ended up in trouble. So then they had this, they had this plan, this this part of the plan, which is to break up the Soviet Union, which they engaged, mm -hmm. because they had to get the Ukrainians back into Ukraine. They mm -hmm. had to try to get the nuclear weapons out of the hands of the Ukrainians. Right. They had to try to control Ukraine. So they had they they had this problem because they had brought freedom to a point in the former Soviet Union that if they didn't handle this right, it would be it would become a genuine revolution. Mm -hmm. And this was always they had thought a lot of these things through, but they had didn't they didn't know how bad it was going to get. Right. And Kalashnikov, uh, uh, one thing they knew when the problems were hitting Russia, he said in Vienna there they were watching. You know, remember when the crowds in Moscow were going and they they took you know they went out in front of the Lubi uh, of the Lubyanka that's the KGB headquarters in uh, Moscow. Uh, and they were out there protesting. And he said, when they when they took down Felix Dzerzhinsky's statue with mm -hmm. a crane, mm -hmm. and carted it off rather mm -hmm. than destroying it, he said, then we knew it was all it was all okay. It was all under control. Exactly. Yeah. Especially especially since under Putin, uh, folks like Stalin and and Felix Dzerzhinsky are now heroes once again under uh, Vladimir Putin in United Russia. What's interesting, you mentioned East Germany was a test case, uh, a really, uh, a really the failure at least in the short term, not necessarily in the long term as we look at Germany today. But in the short term, what Gorbachev wanted to do was replace Honecker with Egon Krenz. And Egon Krenz was the new, quote, reformist dictator of East Germany from, what was it, October 18th, 1989, till about early December 1989. And according to an unnamed East, East German intelligence defector who defected in late 1989, early 1990, and released this information to Lali Weymouth of the Washington Post, talked about how, and this is corroborated more or less by other sources, there was a meeting between the Soviet ambassador uh, to East Germany, who I believe was Valentin Fallon, uh, or no, he was, the East, he was the international, head of the International Department of the Communist Party, Soviet Union, excuse me, but he was an ambassador at one time. Egon Krenz, Hans Modrow, and East German intelligence officers and the Soviet ambassador to East Germany, I believe. And they had a meeting where it was agreed that, and Krenz was in this meeting, Krenz resigned, Hans Modrow became the new East German leader, another reformist communist, he was a party boss from Dresden, and then he led East Germany. They were trying to create this kinder, gentler East German state, even though the East German state still was committed to the Warsaw Pact, still committed to socialist alliance against Western NATO capitalism. They still were supporting communist movements and terrorist groups and whatnot, at least in speech. They were selling weapons to the Iraqis. There were trade deals in late 1989 through East German front companies to sell Iraq and some of the other allies. Uh, weaponry and whatnot. So, you know, this thing is continuing. And even into early 1990, there were war, Warsaw Pact war plans in which the East Germans took part in and drives against the West in which would be used nuclear weapons. You know, this kinder, gentler, reformist East German government, you know, I mean, go figure. Uh, so, and then what happened was there was an election in March 1990. And of course, the East Germans, they privatized their, the Communist Party privatized its wealth, channeled it to the SED PDS, as the ruling Communist Party was known at that point, they lost the election despite massive Soviet support and Eastern and government uh, funds, including gold. 
And that's when, according to Soviet documents uh, throughout 1990, there were conversations between uh, Vladimir Khrushchev, the KGB boss, uh, chairman at the time, Gorbachev, and other high-level Soviet officials, Premier Rizhkov. And they were talking about how the East German situation was uncontrollable, that the Soviets, they got to take care and take control of their assets of the MFS, which is the uh, Ministry of State Security and the Foreign Intelligence Service of Cuba. We got to take care of these guys and, you know, make sure that they don't get hurt. And many went to the Soviet Union and others transfer their, <coughs> became operational agents for the KGB. Uh, in East Germany's dying day and into a reunified East Germany. And we got to control the process where Germany would at least be uh, neutralized, uh, reunified, but neutralized op openly. And then we're going to dissolve the Warsaw Pact and NATO. And that was the Soviet strategy. And they really lost control for a while in, uh, in, um, in the German question, in, in really remolding East Germany. And of course, today what happened was, is you had East German and Stasi officers, uh, they worked for the Russians. They worked for Gazprom. Some of them worked with China and drumming up business for China and things of that nature. Uh, so now, of course, you know, people are probably saying, well, this happened, you know, 20 some odd years ago. Who cares? Well, we, when we take a look at Germany today, I mean, Germany is, German firms are totally in bed, well, not all of them, but many are totally in bed with China. You have a, a, a substantial uh, Russian economic footprint to the point where Putin has made jokes about how he controls the flow of gas. And if we cut off the gas, well, you know, you guys are just going to be burning wood. I mean, Putin said that years ago in his sort of sardonic humor. Um you know, and, uh, you know, when we take a look at Angela Merkel, uh, as you've documented, German intelligence, uh, apparently, according to some of your sources, had warned uh, that she was not kosher. And when you look at her background, I mean, she was uh, active in the Free German Youth, which is the East German Communist Youth Program and everything else. So this is very relevant for today. Uh, so I wanted to kind of make it make that point for the audience. So this is just not ancient history that they're re restudying. So what do you think the purpose of this Russian plan is? I mean, my point of view, by getting rid of what Yorgi Rabatov and Gorbachev talked about, let's talk about getting rid of the enemy image. What is the strategic purpose of that, Jeff? Well, it's obviously you get the person's guard to go down. You get the other side to, and then you are able, communists are able to work more freely in the West by pretending to be moderates. Mm -hmm. Where we can, this is where we can get a Clinton administration or an Obama administration, mm -hmm. where you can bring all kinds of people in who are of that ilk. Um, but uh, wanting to get back to the changes in Germany, we, we've really only scratched the surface. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, what happened in, in Germany. Uh, you oh, had the, uh, the, the, the uh, German interior minister in October of 1990. This was a critical period. Mm. He had this banker assassinated. You had an assassination attempt uh, by Dieter Kaufmann. Mm -hmm. of um, Wolfgang, Sch Wolfgang Schauble, I think mm. it, it was his name, yeah. the interior minister of Germany. And what was interesting is when that assassination, if you want to know what that assassination was about, I read it in the papers at the time. And the story that followed that assassination is that two of the deputies of the West German intelligence service, then mm. when when Schauble had, did, was not killed, they fled to Moscow. Mm-hmm. Mm. So you, this is evidence that the that somebody's trying to manipulate the West German government, mm -hmm. and they have just failed in a big way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, you you have this, and of course uh, this goes again to you know going back to what uh, uh, what uh, Kalashnikov told me, and of course Kalashnikov. When all of these disasters occurred, he was summoned to Moscow by the head of the KGB uh, First Chief Directorate, mm -hmm. um, 
because he was going to be uh, quizzed about the banks in Austria. Mm -hmm. uh, about they wanted to move money, Communist Party, KGB money abroad, and they wanted to use some of the banks in Austria for some of it. And um, uh, he said, you know, to uh, forget the name of the, the guy that was in charge of it is on the tip of my tongue. But uh, he, um, uh, Kalashnikov asked him, he says, well, we've suffered a bad defeat here in Germany. Mm -hmm. This plan didn't go the way we were supposed to. And he said, well, we've had some setbacks. Yes. But, you know, basically, we're on track to fool the West. We're on track to move money where we want, to get the West to open up to us, to, you know, we've, we've, we've got these defeats, but we can manage this. We, we're, we're set for this long-term thing where we're going to be able to, uh, to do things. Um, so then... Uh, I just wanted to bring those points forward. Uh, Very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, and then as far as what they're trying to achieve, going back to your question, you know, it's it's like uh, uh, he was told at the time is the the real idea is tech, access to technology and capital from the West mm -hmm. that the opening was going to give them, and the ability for agent networks in other Western countries, in France and UK, but especially in the United States to advance people who were favorable to those values, socialist mm -hmm. values, in the U.S. And, of course, we've seen in this past 30 years, this is what they've been able to do. They've made their most tremendous progress since the fall of the Soviet Union is right here in the U.S. As, uh, you know, as mentioned, in this, here's this book, Matthew Lohmeyer's book, mm -hmm. which is... Um, uh, called Irresistible Revolution. It's about Marxism's goal of conquest and the unmaking of the American military. And he's describing basically how Marxists have basically taken over the Pentagon and are, are changing the U.S. military into something that's amenable to Marxism. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to know what their goal was. As long as there was a Cold War, as long as there was a Soviet Union, a big boogeyman, you know, and this is where where Georgi Arbatov says we're taking away the image of your en of of mm -hmm. of your enemy. We're we're taking away your enemy, is is that um, is that this? And he called it their uh, their secret weapon. Mm -hmm. This secret weapon allows them then to subvert us better. Exactly. I know. And you might want to put the book. Uh... Colonel, uh, Colonel Lohmeyer's book a little bit further back so people can see it because that's a book yeah. I'd like to also. Yeah, I, 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 I know, I know the focus of my my camera uh, has a little trouble. Yeah, I, that book know, is because, that book is available on Amazon.com. So. Irresistible Revolution by Matthew Lohmeyer. Yeah, and I would I would recommend to people that they get it and read it because it's astonishing really what's happened in our own country if this is what's happened to our own military so when you ask what their goal is there it is this is the goal um and they they've gotten a lot of mileage out of this well, um, just so the audience doesn't think you and i are crazy let's go over a few things here that they've achieved since the end of the Cold War. Starting under the George Trevor Walker Bush administration, even Ronald Reagan with the INF Treaty, you have American military build down uh, with our nuclear weapons, with our sub fleets, with the closing of tank factories where we only have only one left in Lima, Ohio. It's a government owned facility, by the way. Uh, and uh, the Obama administration and the Clinton administrations tried to close it down. Fortunately, it was fought off. President Trump, one of the things that I do agree with him, he preserved that tank production facility. Uh, you have the uh, build down of and the outsourcing of our defense production, and really George W. Bush and uh, H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton really put the sort of privatization of our military functions really on steroids, if you will, and giving tremendous amount of power to defense contractors who outsource productions even to hostile countries. I mean, to, Boeing, China. to China, to China and Russia, Boeing. There, there was a trumpeted press release, uh, Boeing, uh, you know, provide uh, outsources design facility to Putin's Russia, for example. So, and this is what happens when you put a lot of your defense policy more and more in the hands of private corporations, because like anything else, they're, 
I, I mean, you take a look at Eric Prince, Betsy DeVos's brother, you know, Mr. Conservative flag waving patriot. He has this training school in China, training mm -hmm. Chinese uh, security people there. I mean, this is the problem. And this is where, of course, one of the many reasons why I became disillusioned with privatization and free market economics and market fundamentalism without becoming fully a socialist or a totalitarian collectivist. Um, but moving forward, uh, you have the new START treaty, the START treaty, and then the new START treaty. Uh, that was passed post-Russia. You have China and Russia both getting permanent normal trade relations. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on. I yeah, mean, let's talk about some of the more important weapons. Look, uh, U.S., you have this very complicated industry in the United States for manufacturing nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. They literally disassembled it. They literally sent these people home. Mm -hmm. We, after George Herbert Walker Bush, there was no more testing, actual mm -hmm. testing. The way they test nuclear weapons now is they have mm -hmm. a computer model and they just virtually test, but that's not a real test. As Peter no. Pry will no. tell you, uh, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, this virtual testing. Um, but uh, our tritium plants, when you get into uh, Clinton becoming president, they're getting rid of our tritium. Tritium is, you know, when you say a mm -hmm. hydrogen bomb, the tritium mm -hmm. is the hydrogen in the hydrogen bomb, right? Mm -hmm. So you've, you've, you, 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 and this is how you refresh your nuclear uh, weapons. So we, we were lo we, we basically step by step, we destroyed our own. We have not manufactured a new nuclear warhead since George Herbert Walker Bush was president. Mm -hmm. And that That's was almost 30 years ago. Well, the shelf life is wearing out of our yeah. nuclear weapons right now. Yeah. So I talk well, they're near the end. In fact, they've it's amazing. They've extended the shelf life now much further past what it... Uh, if you had said to somebody in 2000, oh, we're going to be using these same nuclear weapons in 20... You know, in, in 2021, they would look at you and go, we can't make them last that long. I mean, it's an amazing feat that we have gotten them to last this long. And it's not going to be much longer. Um, and so, and we're not going to have any new nuclear warheads, you know, because they put so little money to it over such a trickled long period of time till 2029. It's the first time we're going to have one. So we've got a gap where uh, the head of the strategic command gave his testimony a year ago last uh, uh, April, and he said, look, uh, 2023, basically our nuclear arsenal is uh, becomes unreliable, and uh, we, we don't know whether these weapons are going to be workable, and we won't have a new one until 2029, and Congress has always been good. They've always filled the gap. Of course, what, look at the Congress he's talking about. It's a majority Democrat Congress mm -hmm. that, uh, that has people uh, like uh, uh, Anastasia... Uh, Cortez, right? Well, Alexandria Ocasio. A Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, sorry, Alexandria. Who was involved in DSA, by the way, which is a Marxist group. Right. I mean, and she's so obviously Marxist. A AOC is such obvious Marxist. So, so Alexandria uh, Ocasio Cortez, whatever her name is, AOC. It's much easier to say. Um, she's she's this is she's sort of the the face of this Congress where even Nancy Pelosi is deferring to her because she's she's popular, right, with the young people. Right, yes, yes. Um, and so this is not a Congress that's going to renew our nuclear weapons because spending bills have to begin in the House. Correct. These people aren't going to, you know, I'm sorry, you didn't elect a Republican Congress. Well, we don't know what happened with the election here. But the very fact that these kind of people can be elected in this country is, uh, it's like, we're going to have a tremendous tragedy here in this country. And I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you right now, millions of Americans are going to die because we're irresponsible, because we have not thought correctly and we've not done what we should do. You have to come to terms with this. Um, this can't go on without some tragic thing happening to our country. And the, the, uh, the pandemic is just one tragic effect that they could get away with having a virus come out of a Chinese lab. And I know you probably saw the headlines now that are out are saying that they can't find an ancestor of this 
virus, a natural one. Well, I remember they were saying before, no, this could never be possibly an engineered at the Institute of Virology in Wuhan. And now all of a sudden they're shifting gears a little bit. I mean, for the record, as I mentioned in this program with Herschel, I do believe that he, this uh, virus was a biological weapon purposely released or accidentally released. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence to show, I mean, Defense Department reports from the 1990s, as far back as the 1990s that I've read, indicate that China has had a biological weapons program. This is during the time of the Clinton detente, uh, by the way, in the 1990s that the Defense Department was uh, discussing this. You have, uh, there was, I don't remember her name, but she got some interviews out of it, uh, who was a defecting PRC virologist who said this was a weapon. You have Chinese officials, professors, academics, have government academics. I posted it on my Nat Pop uh, Facebook page from politics. They're admitting that COVID was biological warfare and that they defeated the United States or injured the United States. You take a look at General Chi Hao Shin's secret speech of 2005. This is something to take serious. And you know what, Jeff? I asked myself this question. How in the world has the United States survived? I mean, it's just incredible how we have survived barely as a country because we are rotting from within. And oh, I... Yeah. Yeah, we really are. We're rotting from within because of the, you know, and this is the position of this show, um, from the greed promoted, greed and crass materialism and toxic variants of individualism um, propounded by much of the mainstream right and the sort of anti-patriotism, anti-nationalism and grasping at times foreign solutions to impose in the United States that is alien to the American psyche. So you have that in question. I mean, to summarize the left, I remember reading in a commentary article by David Horowitz and Peter Collier. I mean, David Horowitz, I have, let's just say, very mixed opinions on him. Mm. But he quoted... He quoted a, I think it was a child carrying a Viet Cong flag and holding a sign, and it really summarized much of the extreme left's attitude is, you know, it's it's basically cheerly, oh, you know, it was something to the, gosh, I forget what it said, but it basically was saying that alienation is when you want your country to be defeated, basically, and this was during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that I could never identify at this point with either side. And I look at our country's independence and survival being assaulted from both sides. And some of this I've seen personally. So how have we survived, in your opinion, Jeff? How? Well, I'm, I, it's sort of like anyone who has a really bad lingering disease uh, it's still killing us. It's just killing us slower than you might have expected. Uh, it's still killing the country. I mean, you saw what happened in the election last year. You saw them tearing down the statues last summer of Washington and and Ulysses S. Grant and Teddy Roosevelt. You mm -hmm. you saw what was happening in the country, the tragedy, and you saw the non-reaction from the American people and mm -hmm. from President Trump, let's be honest. President Trump did not crack down on that. He was afraid. He was intimidated. You had uh, generals, and this goes back to what Lohmeyer said, generals who were saying, oh, no, you know, we're basically backing the Black Lives Matter. We're not, we're going to let them loot and burn and whatever. We're not going to allow the Insurrection Act to be. Uh, so basically the country could not defend the property of people. Property is not going to be defended. Um and they were embracing the idea, this idea that we're a white racist country and the country deserves to burn. Well, look and, at what Antifa says, uh, you know, Andy No, who's a journalist, and I know he's controversial in some circles, but he is brought out in his book. And I covered this in a previous episode of this show, a solo episode of different things I've been picking up from different books. And he quoted one of the Antifa groups because there are various groups 
uh, basically saying uh, liberation occurs when the United States dies. It's basically paraphrasing what it is. Mm -hmm. And that's that, that just tells me what I need to know about the extreme left. And that they're dangerous from whatever critiques, legitimate, very dangerous, that, whatever cr legitimate critiques they have. You always have to look at well, what are their motivations? What do they actually want to do? What are they cheerleading? And when you say that the United States dies, doesn't mean necessarily something wonderful and utopian is going to replace. It means it. probably well, millions of nightmare. people are going to die. That probably well, yes. means millions of people are going to die. Well, in volume one of my book, I talk about how there are Americans uh, who were on the extreme left who embraced violence. They have violent tendencies and engaged in violent actions on college campuses as far back as the 1960s into the 1980s. So my thing, and we're going to talk about this in one of our future episodes when we discuss the Red Dawn scenario. Um, no, I am convinced that there will be Americans to willing to collaborate with the Russians and the Chinese if, if and when they invade the United States, if that's what they choose as strategically feasible, if they can get away with it and mobilize mm. populations behind them. I don't, I don't see that they, right now, any obstacle. It's like, look, I, I'll, I'll, I know we're getting to the end. I'll kind of wrap this up. Look, I, yes. when I read the defector literature, I came to the conclusion that the Soviet Union was going to collapse, not spontaneously, but because that was a plan that the mm -hmm. defectors had talked about, that the Warsaw Pact alliance was going away, and that I became convinced that our analysts, our intelligence people were stupid enough to believe it, mm -hmm. and that uh, our culture, our media, our politicians would not only believe it, it would be mandatory for them to believe it. Mm -hmm. This was like a crystal ball to look at the defectors. Mm -hmm. I looked at the defectors, I could tell what was going to happen years into the future. And I could tell that we were going to disarm, mm -hmm. and at some point in the future they were going to rearm. Mm -hmm. All of this has taken place, and that China and Russia would get together. That's what Galitzin said, one clenched fist, they were going to get together, which they did. And if you go to other defectors like Colonel Stanislav Lunov, who said, look, Russia and China have this invasion plan for the North America, again, when you look at defectors, what they are warning of, what they are telling you is a crystal ball because it's not magic. It's the fact that the communists are following a plan. Mm -hmm. They have somewhere they want to go and there's nobody really stopping them. So we're going to end up going there. We went to the fall of the Soviet Union. We went to the collapse. We went to the, we disarmed. They've rearmed. Now they're getting ready to exert their military advantage. And now the invasion, the bombing and invasion of the United States becomes a possibility now. And this is the moment at which we have arrived now mm -hmm. in the defector literature. So people say, okay, you're crazy. Well, show me where we've been, where did I get something wrong? Well, well, I mean, well, yeah. you haven't because you mentioned this in an article and I tracked down the quote and I have it here in my book. Pravda writer Dmitry Sudikov wrote, the West, having discarded Russia, has been cutting its tanks and destroying tactical nuclear weapons. Russia, feeling its own weakness, kept all tanks and tactical nuclear weapons. Let me repeat it, audience. Kept all tanks and tactical nuclear weapons. So forget about arms control working. It doesn't work, sadly. As a result, Russia overcome the inertia of collapse and started reviving its power, while the West, being lulled by sweet daydreams of the liberal, meaning classical liberal, end of history, castrated its armed forces to the point when they could be good for leading colonial wars with weak and technically backward enemies. The balance of forces in Europe has thus changed in Russia's favor when the Americans realized that it was too late. So for those of you that are saying that Jeff Nyquist is crazy, I just refer to Dmitry Sudikov. And the Russian press is kept a tight leash by the Russian state, directly and indirectly. You don't believe me, ask dead Russian journalists. Mm-hmm that have been poisoned, jailed, or, and killed. Yeah. And look. Yeah. And they, and they do have these amazing, I mean, that piece that you refer to, that was a two-part piece that the Russians published, in which they basically were laughing at us. 
So they will actually come out with it because they want to give their own people a chance to cheer for what they've done. So they came out and said, this was a few years ago, they came out and said, we beat them. We've defeated and outmaneuvered the United States. Now our strategy worked. Um, and yeah, it's it's there in black and white. And, and you can read it and people look at it and they go, oh, it's chilling. But then they go back to their lives and they think, oh, no, everything's going to go back to normal. No. Nothing is ever going to go back to normal. The, 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 this uh, pandemic is just one phase of a larger attack on our society. There's more to come. This is just mm-hmm. the beginning of it. And if you think that this, we're going to go back to normal now, and we've got this idiot as president, and these Democrats who believe in socialism are, are going to not push it on the country and not going to disarm the country further, and that we stand a chance of losing our nuclear arsenal, if the United States ends... How many of us will survive physically? I, I don't know how many. It's not going to be a pretty picture. Well, that's the thing. And that's where things are going to get uh, very dicey. And that's where I was saying you're going to have collaborators coming out of the woodwork, depending on the Russian-Chinese plans, depending on the political dynamics in the United States. You're going to have resistors and whatnot. You know, what is it? Truth is stranger than fiction, and sometimes fiction is truth. So, you know, movies like Red Dawn and America and whatnot, and there are novelizations of uh, similar genres like I, Martha Adams and Vandenberg, which I have in my bookshelf, as a matter of fact, great books on alternative histories of Soviet and Russian Chinese invasions of the United States and what society would be like. It's pretty awful. And one thing to, to, to before we close about uh, close the show because uh, we do have to end in a few moments. Um, you mentioned about socialism in our earlier discussion on privatization. I wanted to leave this one quote, and this I found on LexisNexis's Academic Universe through the BBC uh, transcripts of international broadcasts. And this is a speech uh, given by Yel- Pre- uh, Boris Yeltsin back in 1990 when the Soviet Union still existed. It was a press conference on Soviet television, June 2nd, 1990. And he cautioned communists in Russia, Yeltsin. He said, quote, I think that the socialist nature or the level and share of a society's socialist nature does not depend on the number of times the word socialism is pronounced. That is why the absence of the word socialism in my speech does not in any way show that I altogether reject this idea. We simply have to give it a different sense. That's the crux of the matter. A different sense, a different model. It will not depend on the name. And again, that goes back with deception. The Russian state and the Communist Party Soviet Union as studies by Yevgeny Novikov, who was a former uh, Soviet International Department official who defected under Gorbachev and was an advisor at Gorbachev, wrote a whole report on this in the James, for the Jamestown Foundation. The privatization, aided and embedded by Amer- American free market economists, who were just, you know, well, I won't get into my opinions on them. Um, this whole process was managed by the Communist Party Soviet Union. And the Russian state still can, uh, owned uh, the commanding heights of industry. So really and truly, Russia it was in many ways a semi-socialist economy under Yeltsin and Putin. You had the state having tremendous influence there. Uh, so that's the thing. Because what do you gain when you say, we're not socialists anymore, or we're not going to use the term socialism in our speech anymore? Well, the West is going to go to sleep. We're going to disarm. We're going to say that the Cold War is over and you're going to globalize your economy, deregulate your economy, financialize it. In our view of the show, that only is like pouring gasoline on the fire because that makes people more amenable uh, to socialists and communists and fascist ideas. And we're really in deep trouble. Uh, and People look at a quote like this and they think, oh, big deal. What is it? It's just a speech. Well, let me tell you, communists do tell you as much as they lie through their teeth. They drop, as our friend Jimmy from Brooklyn say, read the communist press because there's a lot of indirect admissions in there. 
Jeff, what is your thought about this quote? And do you have anything to close with? Yeah, well, um, I would make a comment about uh, somebody who studied, uh, you know, Ludwig von Mises wrote the famous book Socialism. Mm -hmm. And one of the points that Ludwig von Mises uh, made in the book is he says there's no such thing as a socialist economy. A socialist economy is a Stone Age economy where the only thing, only property is some sharp rock you pick up off the ground that you turn into an arrowhead. You know, that uh, that this is really what socialism means, that any complex economy is a market economy. It, it has market mechanisms. And, uh, and, and in, a lot of people have pointed out, you know, Alec Nove's uh, Economic History of the USSR mm -hmm. pointed out that really the, the uh, however this uh, socialist managed socialist economy, it was state capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an economy that was based on a restriction of consumption. Mm -hmm. That's what Alec Noves shows. Mm -hmm. And it was like, this is how they managed it. They restricted consumption. So there was only certain things you could get, and then all consumption was focused for the military, for Precisely. military consumption. And Nove is considered an authority on this, by the way. And Nove is considered an authority. His economic history of the USSR is, is a must-read um, for those that want to understand how this worked. And so the command economy is largely a myth in the sense that uh, anybody who studied the Soviet military economy, it's a much more free market economy in terms of military production than ours is. Our procurement system is a, a horror Right, it's yes, all kinds of with government f favors and 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 all kinds of strange things where military people end up as on the boards of these companies. Yes. This is a, a corrupt. The, the Soviets wouldn't tolerate this. They have companies in the Soviet Union that are competing to make similar. You got Sukhoi, right? You've got the MiGs, mm -hmm. and you've got they're they're competing to make things, and they're going to lose the contract to the one that does better, that works harder. So mm -hmm. they have actual real competition under their state capitalist managed system in their military sector we don't our contract system is corrupt and they would not allow that to happen so why when at the end of the cold war we went to test our pershing missiles and a lot of them they didn't work that well and when they tested their ss-20s those mm -hmm. things every single one of them worked perfect and fired perfectly mm -hmm. When well, they, because they concentrate their resources into the military intelligence procurement to some degree in the export economy uh, of certain products. And that's the reason of existence uh, for the Russian state and for, certainly for the Soviet state. When it came to consumer goods, I mean, few and far between, most of them were rather substandard or just mediocre yeah. at best. Uh, yeah, light industry was a joke in the Soviet Union. They didn't care about the consumer products. They didn't care that if you plug, you turn on your TV, it would blow up and catch fire. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously they have better consumer products now. But look at the look at who would who would buy a Russian car? Even who today, would buy a Russian car today. Even today, and they yeah. look better. I've seen them online. They look nice. I mean, in some ways, they look copied from Western models, but nevertheless, they look a lot better. Uh, but look, I mean, they produce good cars for the elites. I mean, the ZIL limousines, for mm. example, um, the Chaikas, they were considered well, very... Even cool. then, the elites prefer, you know, Mercedes. <laughs> well, that's true. Yes, the elites... They, preserve, like they Mercedes prefer Mercedes. Mercedes. Yes, that is true. Um, my one, one, one of my good friends, Miles Canner, used to call them the Maserati Marxists. <laughs> mm. Right. Well, I mean, there's the famous story of one of the one of Yeltsin's prime ministers, um, you know, basically wanting to be patriotic and drive a Russian car mm -hmm. and and always having it breaking down. One one day he's in the middle of traffic in Moscow and he's blocking traffic and a steam coming out from under his hood and people are shouting at him, get a Mercedes, you idiot. You know, exactly. um, yeah. but it is it is. You know, this is the thing is, is that these are what we're discussing are complicated issues and there's so many details De you know, the, the, they say that the devil is in the details. And if you want to really understand what happened under the Soviet Union, how it collapsed and what what kind of regime followed it, you really have to go into tremendous details. Uh, if you go and you read uh, David Remnick's Lenin's Tomb. You know, when I finish that book, I think, well, I must be wrong about everything until I get to near the end where he does the interview with the head of the uh, Italian Committee of Inquiry into the Mafia. Mm -hmm. He says, well, Russia's become the capital of international organized crime. Mm 
Mm. And all the three major mafias in Italy, the Calabrian, the Neapolitan, and the Sicilian mafias, they all get their marching orders and go to seminars in Russia. And Russia is where they... And and then I I think back to Joe Douglas and Red Cocaine and the whole thing and the way the KGB manages that and who Putin is and how he comes from that same part of the KGB that managed that through St. Petersburg when he was deputy mayor there. And I realized, and then what his involvements in Spain were, and I realized, look, this is just a charade. This is the same thing as before, that even David Remnick, who was very much fooled by the Kremlin when he wrote Lenin's tomb, that they have been deceived. You know, and it's, That's it's so true. That is so true. It's a complicated subject and whatnot. And we're going to have, I think, about three more episodes of this. Uh, I think we covered quite a bit on the change, so-called changes in the Soviet Union, Russia. I think this was a very good discussion once again. Uh, next episodes, we're going to talk about the Red Dawn scenario. And then we're going to talk about um, conservatism and then also the Democratic Party and take a look at the dynamics within the Democratic Party as well. So. Uh, I want to thank you once again, Jeff, for joining us on the Patriotic Populace. You're a wealth of knowledge. I think after this series, we'll periodically have you on to discuss geopolitics. Uh, I think the higher ups in this country should uh, listen to you uh, a lot more. Um, But I think what you say comes from careful scholarship and a careful understanding of strategy. And it was a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for having me, Nevin. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure.